Welcome to the third and final part of our Day of Crypto Talks. Uh, we have the pleasure now of uh, welcoming Vanessa Teague, who is a professor at the University of Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia, uh, who is an expert on both building secure election systems and breaking election systems that are not quite as secure as they may have claimed. Um, uh, a, a little anecdote I want to mention is that if you do a, a web search for uh, terms like Australia at Laws of Mathematics, um, you will find a rather infamous quote from a couple of years ago from the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Australia that, correct me if I get it wrong, but I think it said that the laws of, of mathematics are very commendable. Uh, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. Um, this, this was a response to um, some proposals of uh, getting access to, to uh, cryptographic systems that w he was being told could not be uh, accessed the way he said. Anyway, uh, Vanessa can claim to be the, the uh, origin of the Prime really Minister. Certain. I'm not really certain about this. Uh, but, but, but likely. Yeah. You, you can complete the story if you want. But the, the reason that the Prime Minister uttered those words. Um, so that's you know, something that should be highlighted, I think, in some place. I but, like to think I planted the seed. <laughs> I'm not absolutely certain. It's a but, direct result. But in any case, you can tell the story or go right into the, the Swiss post. Uh, <laughs> I'll make fun of the paper. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the math behind uh, a Swiss internet voting protocol and some of the implications that turned out to occur for an internet voting protocol in New South Wales. Uh, this is joint work with Olivier Pereira and Sarah Jamie Lewis, who were both looking at the math and the code at the same time. Uh, I'd like to encourage people to butt in and ask questions or offer extra comments, especially citizens of Switzerland who probably know more about at least some aspects of the situation than I do. The background to this, of course, is that with Josh and Alex and others, I've been working for years and years and years on end-to-end -end verifiable cryptographic voting systems. And this system claimed to have some of the properties that we had been working on for a long time. So it was very interesting to go and look at how it worked and to realise, probably not surprisingly, that it actually didn't have really any of the substantial verifiability properties that it had been advertised to have. In some ways, it's like the days of military-grade, super-proprietary encryption algorithms, right? We kept it secret and we patented it, so it must be better than all that open um, academic stuff. This, I think, is almost the frontier of uh, something that we might see for MPC uh, and we might see for sophisticated cryptographic protocols more generally, a thing that claimed to have a bunch of very sophisticated properties, but as soon as it was made openly available, was quite immediately shown to not have those properties. I doubt that I'm going to teach any of the people who knew about crypto anything about crypto. The errors that we were able to identify were things that were already quite well known in the community. Okay, so a little bit of background about the system. Uh, it's for internet voting. It's supported by voting cards that are delivered by mail. So it's a, a code return system. In other words, you get a Swiss voter gets a physical piece of uh, paper in, the, in snail mail. And for each of the voting options that are available to that person, there's a short code, which is just a little, a little six-digit number. And then they vote on a computer. So they choose specific voting options. And then they wait to receive codes back. And if the codes match the voting options that they think they chose, that's supposed to be evidence that the vote was sent in in the way that they wanted to. There's actually some quite reasonably well expressed security requirements that come out of the federal chancellery, that are pretty well, pretty well written as regulations go. 
And the idea is supposed to be not that it completely has end-to-end -end verifiability, but it has this reasonably well-defined weaker property that they call complete verifiability, which is to say the client is not trusted. It's trusted for privacy, but it's not trusted to send in the vote correctly. It, it has to prove that it's done the right thing by generating these return codes. And the back-end server is trusted in a distributed kind of a way that they call complete verifiability, which means the server-side operations are verifiable, assuming that there's at least one honest entity at the server side. So if they all collude together, they can cheat undetectably, but they're not supposed to be able to cheat undetectably unless all of them participate. Actually, if you read the fine print, this isn't really true because somebody has to print the code sheets and once you know what's on somebody's code sheet, it's all over. But at least for some of the entities, this is sort of supposed to be true somewhat a bit. Okay. As well as this reasonably well-defined legislative requirement, there's also a bunch of federal requirements about openness and transparency. And they say specifically for a system that is applying to be certified for use by up to 100% of voters in the electorate, as this system was, the rule is basically that the source code has to be openly available. And specifically it says anyone is entitled to examine, modify, compile and execute the source code. So... Cytel provided some code for Swiss Post, which was then making it available for other cantons. And Swiss Post is now trying to get Cytel's technology certified in keeping with these standards. So they put their code online. And they put it online with an NDA that said the following. You have to read the fine print with a little bit of care. No vulnerability shall be published within a period of 45 days. Like, okay, it's not completely unreasonable. Since the last communication exchanged with the owners with regard to such potential vulnerabilities. Okay, so I read this. I wrote a nice little email to the relevant authorities saying... I've got no problem with 45 days. But I've got a real problem with a Twitter bot that pings me every 45 days for the rest of eternity. And they said, oh, no, 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 we're nice people. We'd never do anything like that. I said, there's no way I'm signing this. Right? Couldn't you use the following loophole? Uh, they talk about communication exchanged rather than sent. So if they send you a message... <laughs> and I don't reply. <laughs> that's true. I think it's that's true. Do they should send reliably? Yeah, well, exactly. That's what Artie said. Do you, do you guarantee that they um, reply? Well, in any case, we didn't sign it. Um, somebody else signed it and then just posted it on the web anyway. Uh, I don't know who it is. I don't quite speak German, but I don't think it means thank you ever so much for your NDA. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in practice, the code circulated quite widely. And uh, Olivier and I happened to be at Financial Crypto at the time. I had sworn that I was never going to look at another system of this kind, right? I was going to go somewhere else and do something sensible, work on positive things for humankind and never look at any source code from this company ever again. Uh, but, you know, we were just going to have a quick look for 10 minutes or so. Couldn't make head or tail of the code. Decided to have a look at the PDF files. At the same time, in parallel with us, Sarah Jamie Lewis was looking at it in Canada and she was writing a bunch of stuff that was really quite openly scathing. So she's saying, oh, this code, you know, it, it triggers every flag. Uh, I can't figure out what's going on. It's a total mess. And, and Seitel was quite openly writing back to her, or not back to her, but putting out this kind of public statement saying, we're aware of some uninformed commentary, but, you know, no, nobody who actually knows what they're doing has ever found anything wrong with our wonderful stuff. 
So Olivia and I are sitting around at Financial Crypto, thinking about whether to go to the beach and saying, you know, we'll, we'll just have a very quick look at this, then we'll go to the beach. Couldn't make head or tail of the code. Looked, began to look at the documentation, the specification, which is reasonably clear. And has this method for generating the base values for Peterson commitments. Which says, well, first generate a random exponent, then you know, raise the generator to that random exponent, do the same for the other base value of the Peterson commitment, those are your generators. So if you already know what a Peterson commitment is, in, the, in Sarah Jamie Lewis's words, this raises a flag. Uh, if you don't, here's the slide. A Peterson commitment, so just as a rough idea, who already knows immediately what a Peterson commitment is and sees the problem straight away? Who doesn't already know what a Peterson commitment is and wants to see the slide? Okay, um, I will go through it fast. The idea is we take these two different base values, G and H, and we commit to some message M by taking a random R and computing G to the power of R, H to the power of M. It's perfectly hiding because the distribution for a given message M is uh, uniform over the whole space of uh, the things generated by G, assuming R is random. And it's computationally binding if you don't know the discrete log in base G of H. But if you do know the discrete log base G of H, it's obviously possible to open a commitment any way you like based on high school maths. So in fact a Peterson commitment is a trapdoor commitment, that's what it's called. It's a commitment that's binding unless you know the trapdoor value, um, the discrete log of H base G, in which case you can open anything any way you want. So The way this should have been done is picking G and H in some way that made it clear that you didn't know uh, one discrete log with respect to the other. But that's not how they did it. And in fact, <sighs> long bizarre story, but anyway. You're assuming that Q is prime here? I'm assuming that Q is prime here. So you, you cannot even pick up the generator. I mean, finding the generator of a ZQ is a hard problem. So uh, they, had, yeah. they have the group kind of already set up. So okay. I, I probably should have said that more clearly. So they've already got a group set up with um, a P prime, Q, Q being prime, P is 2Q plus 1, okay. and um, G is a generator of the group, which, which they always choose to be 2 for some reason. So, uh, I got these slides, Olivier, uh, originally from Olivier, and I've written, uh, I've left Olivier's incredulity in here, even though I didn't really share it. So, Olivier says, no, this isn't possible. They implemented this huge, sophisticated system. It's been through several independent reviews, which was true. It had um, several security proofs have been published. Maybe there's a bug in the dock, but, uh, you know, I'm sure that the code does something different. At which point I said to Olivier, look, I've met these people before. Let's have a look at the code. <laughs> so here's the code. Uh, now you can see I, I have edited it to make the trapdoors explicit. So this white bit here is my, my edit. This blue thing here is uh, Seitel's original code, which gets a vector of random elements, which in, in practice is just the one element used for the Peterson commitments. So let's look at what get vector random element actually it does. That's here. Uh, it does exactly what it said in the spec, right? It generates a random exponent and then it raises its generator to that random exponent. So it, it not only doesn't prove that it hasn't got a trapdoor, it explicitly generates the trapdoor and then we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that we forgot it. <laughs> So, 
at this point, it's, it's kind of taken us 20 minutes to notice this problem. It takes us maybe half a day to like carefully write out the maths and understand how to use this in the context of the Bayer-Groth mix net to actually forge a, a shuffling proof. Uh, then it takes four days to get the code to compile and another four days to figure out how the information flow actually works to actually implement the three lines of code necessary to run the attack. We generated proof transcripts that passed the little verification tests that were part of their code. Um, hardly anybody else on planet Earth could even get the code to compile, so nobody else has ever come to me to tell me that they have actually run our verification code. But if you got the Swiss Post code to compile, you should also be able to download the fake proofs from my website and run them through the verifier uh, and see that they pass. So in summary, the error in the generation produces a trapdoor in the system, which breaks the whole verifiability of the shuffling proof that was supposed to be there. So there was supposed to be this back end, this um, semi, mostly untrusted part of the back end system, which was supposed to shuffle all the encrypted votes that it had received. Then it was supposed to decrypt them all. It was supposed to prove that it had shuffled properly and prove that it had decrypted accurately. We've just shown that it can forge a shuffling proof in which it actually duplicates some votes and drops some others while still passing this elaborate verification process. Now, this would be a bug even if checking proper generation was absent from the verification spec. Right? But it's not only absent from the verification spec, it's not even properly done in the generation of the proof in the first place. So it's not a simple matter of adding an extra line to the verification spec saying, make sure you check that these generators are generated in the right way, because the generators aren't even generated in the right way. So exploiting this trapdoor is completely undetectable in the sense that the transcript of a faked proof is indistinguishable, in fact, is identical in distribution to a, a proper truthful uh, proof. You know, is it on purpose? Is it just a cover up to make it look like a mistake? Is it that they don't understand basic crypto? Is it total negligence? Who knows, right? I carefully wrote, or we carefully wrote, I should say, nothing in our analysis suggests that this problem was introduced deliberately. It's entirely consistent with a naive implementation of a complex cryptographic protocol by well intentioned people who lacked a full understanding of its security assumptions and other important details. Uh, on the other hand, if you did want to put a trapdoor into a supposedly verifiable voting system, maybe you'd try to hide it in plain sight like this and then kind of write it off as naivety. <laughs> so we told Swiss Post. Swiss Post pointed, Swiss Post kind of thought about it for a while and then said actually two other people had pointed out the problem although we were the only ones who had actually turned it, actually written out the exploit. It turned out Seitel also knew about the problem. And this is Swiss Post's press release, which said, the error in the source code relates to universal verifiability. It was already identified in 2017. Swiss Post regrets that the correction was not made. <laughs> Seitel, for reasons that I do not understand. So Objected to, yes. Is this a separate company or? So this is, there's two different entities involved. One is the software provider, which is Cytal. They are providing software to Swiss Post, which is then reselling the, like the elections as a service, if you like, to various Swiss cantons. So, They've been kind of working together, but now that something's gone wrong, um, it, it's, not, it's not clear whose fault it is, right? And the, and the marketing about whose fault it is is not consistent. Seidel is based in Barcelona. Yeah, so yes. I don't know if you want to talk about it. Do you know something out that happened? Because historically, Swiss Post actually had some decent crypto development side, but at some point they must have decided to go with an outside vendor, right? Right. So were I they approached or were... I do not know when they yeah. changed or why. And I mean, Geneva was also working with the guys from Bern and that project got discontinued, right? So I don't know how this came to be the one and only surviving project. 
but yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so Seitel disagreed with both of these things. First of all, they said, um, following the recent publication of Swiss Post's media release, which is the thing I showed on the previous slide, part of its contents appears to have been misinterpreted, resulting in third parties stating that the vulnerability identified had already been acknowledged by Seitel in 2017 without being acted upon. Well, yes, that was indeed what I thought it said. Um, actually, we implemented it. Actually, we implemented proper verifiable random generation for those parameters in the Peterson commitments as required. And after they pointed this out, we went back and looked in the code, and indeed this was true. They had implemented it. They just didn't call it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went on to say, therefore, it is by no means a naive interpretation by people who didn't know what they were doing. Mistakes were made. <laughs> exactly. Mistakes were made. But not naively, right? Which really... <laughs> oh, right, no. But with hard was naive, but yeah. understood. Yeah, exactly. Highly intelligent, careful mistakes were made. Um, so, okay. Now the Federal Chancellery uh, also made uh, some public statements. They said uh, they called on Swiss Post to review and improve their security processes and also to review and adapt the conditions for accessing the source code. Because remember, there was quite a, a gap between at least what my interpretation of that ordinance demanding open um, access to the source code was and the uh, contents of that NDA. Okay, but, you know, in Switzerland, at least so far, it wasn't a huge deal because this was only for a system that they were proposing to use sometime in the next six months. Uh, this was March. They were planning to use it in October. Worst thing that happened was they didn't use it in October. And anyway, they had plenty of time to fix it. Good thing they had some genuine independent review before they used it. But remember, this isn't just a Swiss thing. This company sells software all over the world. In New South Wales, they were already running it for their election. Okay, so this is March 13th. Uh, Early voting on the iVote system had already started. Election day is March 23rd, and they use it for... You're allowed to vote up to two weeks before the election. So the Electoral Commission puts out a, a press release, which I think this journalist has summed up perfectly, Justin Hendry, who says, New South Wales Electoral Commission confirms iVote contains critical cyto crypto, uh, cri critical cyto crypto defect, but declares it safe for running anyway in upcoming election. <laughs> So, but, but, but wait, how, how, how did this thing get run in a state election without ever having any kind of public access or independent review? Doesn't, surely New South Wales has a law, something like that Swiss law, that demands that something trusted in a state election gets open and public review before the state election. But remember, this is Australia. Uh, on the contrary, we have the opposite law, right? It says anybody who becomes aware of how woeful the privacy protection is and tells anybody goes to jail for six months and anybody who shares the source code with other citizens can be imprisoned for two years. <laughs> but surely they, they would have made it available under some kind of reasonable NDA, right, for, for local experts to have a look at and I had been in discussions with them through January about possible access for local experts. Their NDA, unlike the Swiss NDA, terminates after only five years of promised <laughs> silence. So I said, no, go away. But OK, um, you know, they had a whole two weeks to fix it. So what can we say? So now we fixed the bug. Everything must be perfectly OK now, right? Well, well, hang on a minute. This, this shuffle proof, right? It wasn't just a shuffle proof. It's actually a shuffle and decryption proof, remember? Because you have to prove that you've shuffled properly and then when you decrypt, you have to prove that you've decrypted properly. Let's just spend five minutes looking at the decryption part. So a decryption proof, we're using Elgamal encryption. A decryption proof is an 
ancient and venerable Sean Peterson proof of equality of two discrete logs. I'm guessing that everybody who had seen Peterson Commitments 10,000 times has also seen this 10,000 times. So hand up if you have seen this many times before. Uh, hands up if you haven't seen this many times before and you're like, okay. So I'll do a little explanation of what this is meant to be. So uh, the, the prover has a ciphertext um, and a proposed decryption of the ciphertext, which in this case we're just going to say is one. Because you can always, because Algamal is a multiplicative homomorphic. Once you've proven that something is one, you can then prove that that thing multiplied by any message you like is is a, a encryption of any message you like. So we want to prove that this ciphertext C naught C one prime is a valid Algamal encryption of one, given this public key that we all know. So the way that the proof works is this: uh, we're using the Fiat Shamir heuristic in which rather than getting a random challenge generated by the verifier, we generate our own random challenge by hashing parts of the thing that we're trying to prove. And the key idea is meant to be that as we go through this process of picking some random values, computing some other stuff, receiving our challenge and then answering our challenge, we shouldn't be able to satisfy the verification equations at the bottom unless we successfully guessed or predicted the challenge in advance. And that works great if only you actually remember to hash all of the input values about the thing you're trying to prove. It also works great, it should be said, if you don't have control over what you're trying to prove. So if someone just gives you the ciphertext and you don't get to pick it, and then you run this thing without hashing everything, then that works fine too. But in this case, because the entity that is doing the proof of decryption has just done the shuffle, they do actually get to choose the ciphertext that they're proving something about. And as you can probably see, if you have seen this 10,000 times before, they've omitted to hash all of the important facts about the thing they're trying to prove. And in particular, C0 does not appear in the input to the hash function. So you can generate this proof. You can go through the um, proof transcript. But instead of taking C0 at the beginning, you can wait until you find out what your challenge is. And then you can run these verification equations backwards to compute a, a value of C0 that passes, even though the resulting ciphertext is not an encryption of one. Now, you don't get to choose the meaning of the message because you're, you've only got one solution. If you sit down and look at it carefully, you've only got one possible value. So you end up producing a rubbish ciphertext. It's just nonsense, but it passes verification even though it's not an encryption of one. So a cheating mixer can use this, or a cheating authority that's doing mixing and decryption can use this to fake... Uh, a verified election outcome. It happened that Olivier had already written a paper about how bad this was in the context of Helios. So again, this took Olivier like five minutes to notice and 10 minutes to write out the maths for. In this case, unlike the previous case, you don't get to make something, the attacker doesn't get to make something that absolutely leaves no trace. So this now produces not a valid looking vote for somebody else, but a nonsense vote that gets substituted for a person's real vote. This is not supposed to happen in the system. And informally, it would be obvious that something had gone wrong, although formally verification would pass. So in the rest of the system, what is the effect of uh, garbage? Uh Yes, so this is a really good question. What actually happens in this system if, the, if garbage pops out at the end of the mixnet? Uh, this is still somewhat disputed. If we, we looked very carefully at the verification specification and it does not in any way say uh, verification should fail if garbage comes out at the end of the mixnet. In fact, it seems, it seems that they all 
assumed that it was not possible. So in practice, they didn't think about it very much at all. In principle, there is actually a, a short paragraph in the verification um, specification that explains how to deal with it. That just sort of says, you, you, if, if stuff doesn't, doesn't come out properly, just kind of put it aside and go on. And I think they just wrote it that way because they assumed that it wasn't possible. So formally, if you read the verification specification, uh, verification would pass in this case. Although we agree, and Swiss Post argued that informally, uh, it ought to be obvious that something has gone wrong. But then the question is, if you're not looking for that thing to have gone wrong, would you have noticed that thing going wrong? So Seitel is now saying that they know from all the uh, previous runs of the system that no such problem had occurred. Um, I'm not quite sure on the basis of what evidence they believe that, right? I, I don't know whether they're saying that they really carefully, systematically went through historical data and checked, or whether they're saying nobody has noticed this problem occurring, which is not the same thing at all. Yes? It's just a general question. I'm no expert in voting. So what happens in general, not just in Australia, but maybe elsewhere? I mean, if you know, if something happens to the ballot, right, like if someone burns it, or maybe there's a hardware failure, and then those votes, they, they will not be counted, right? They mm -hmm. can't trash. Basically, so is there any default procedure? How 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 countries usually deal with that? I, I, so this is a really good question. What would happen in any election, electronic or not, if you yeah, yeah. knew that a certain number of ballots had uh, been lost or destroyed? Yeah, they, they happen, but, um, I, I know that in Australia this varies from one state to another and between okay. federal law and state law. I assume it also varies between different countries, but I'm not really sure. Yes. In some Australian states, you have to prove that the gap was big enough to have altered the election outcome. In others, you have to prove that you know something about the ballots that were destroyed. So that was bad. But again, in Switzerland, at least so far, this is not cause for panic because they weren't using this system yet. They were going to use it six months from now. A few days has now passed in New South Wales. <laughs> They're like, it's, I can't remember if it's a few days after or a few days before. I think it's a few days after election day. New South Wales put out a press release saying, oh, the Swiss guys, they had another bug, but it doesn't affect us. Like, this is in the same, exactly the same part of the code. I still haven't un fully understood this particular mystery. No idea. Probably will never know whether this was true or not. But then stuff started to get a little bit more interesting in Switzerland because it turned out that this uh, failure to apply the Fiat Shamir transform correctly affected a lot of other parts of the code. And in particular, it affected a, the part of the code on the voting client that actually casts the votes. And unlike all the other issues that we talked about so far, that only affected the system they were going to use in six months' time, the failure to prove proper generation of the vote at the client side affected systems that they had already been using in other Swiss elections that were already gone, which is why there was this question about whether they had noticed this problem or not. So we haven't talked about the client side at all yet. Um, and we hadn't looked at it at all because, quite frankly, it was just so unbelievably ludicrously complicated. I had actually looked at it, but, you know, I hadn't been able to make head or tail of it. Here's my best two-slide distillation of how it works. Now, remember, just go back to what the client is supposed to be doing. The voter has received some uh, codes printed on a piece of paper that correspond to the voting options that they are, uh, they have a choice of casting. And they're using their computer to vote. So the computer, I don't know why they just, they, I don't know why they didn't generate the codes directly from the vote ciphertext. That would seem to be the natural way to do it, but that's not what they do. Instead, they send two quite separate pieces of data. One is the vote which is expressed as the product of a whole lot of small primes. Each small prime represents a choice in the election. 
And that's one ciphertext all multiplied together and sent off. Then separately, they send off a, a bunch of encrypted values called the partial choice code, which are these things here, PCCI. Um, and each one of them is supposed to be one of the voting options raised to a secret key that the client knows. So it's, and they, they use this kind of multi-element version of El Gamal in which there's not, these, um, these small primes, are they all uh, quadratic residues mod P? Yes. So the question is, are all these small primes quadratic residues mod P? There's another whole like can of worms about like where do these small primes come from? Uh, the, the burn guys noticed, for example, that at no point does the software actually check that they are prime. Uh, there's all kinds of... Just don't even go there. <laughs> they are meant to be quadratic residues, yes. And, and they, is, is the key uh, uh, an even number to sort that out if they're not? The key exponent k? It does actually, in practice, it breaks if they... It, it does actually have things that check for quadratic residues, believe it or not. It, it, it throws exceptions if it gets stuff that is not in the group generated by G believe it or not. And I know because we mucked around with it a bit and I couldn't figure out why it was breaking and that was why. That's a breath of fresh air. Yes. <laughs> but don't get too overconfident. <laughs> so, so, sorry, I'm just trying to parse it. So, the, yes. so these small primes are used to encode the vault. Yes. So you, you choose a different subset depending on the... Exactly. It's a bit, yeah. it's a bit right? It's a yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you, exactly. You choose a different subset of primes depending on what voting options you've chosen, and then they get it. They decrypt this great big ciphertext, and then the factorization is is well defined if they're all small, and uh, and off we Did go. Do they even check that uh, the list of primes doesn't contain repetitions? That is a very good question. <laughs> Ask me again when I'm not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. <laughs> yes. Uh, are the, the mapping between the small primes and the vote uh, unique per voter, or could someone... Uh, no, they're not. That's a good question. So are the map, is the mapping between a small prime and a voting choice unique per voter? No, it's not. It's a universal thing that is you know, effectively public. So we all know that, like, V1 is a vote for the Democrats or whatever the Swiss equivalent is, and, like, V5 is a vote for somebody else or a vote no on some referendum or something. So these are public and announced in advance and well, well known. So they use this slightly funny version of Al-Gamal in which uh, there are uh, sort of, instead of just having a second component, there's multiple different elements to the public key and so multiple different later elements to the ciphertext. So you can encode multiple different separate votes. Um, so each of these public keys is, uh, if you like, G to the S for some, for some other secret some different secret, yes. So anyway, we encrypt a vector of these different partial choice codes. But now because we're not generating the choice codes directly as a function of the vote, we have an obvious potential attack by a cheating client, which is to send in the vote that the cheating client wants but to send in the, the, cho the partial choice codes, which are going to be used to generate the codes that the voter sees as a function of what the voter expects. And they anticipated this, and they made sure that the client would generate uh, a, a series of uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs that proved that the set of partial choice codes that they had submitted matched the set of uh, small primes that the voter had a that had actually been submitted as the vote. So if you think about what this is meant to be, it's meant to be set equivalence, right? I've, I've entered a set of little primes all multiplied together, and I've entered a, a sequence of partial choice codes. The order doesn't matter so much. I want to make sure that the set of values I submitted matches the uh, exponentiations to my secret key of those little primes that I sent as my vote. 
Uh, and I already have a public key that I've already advertised. So how do they do this? Well, there's a fair bit more fine print, but it looks like this. So uh, I should have told the next part of the story, which was we were asked by the Swiss Federal Chancellery to examine Seitel's correction of the problem with the Fiat Shamir proof that I looked at before. And it turns out that the problem had affected these zero-knowledge proofs of consistency of the client side. And so Olivier and I are sitting around kind of looking at their implementation of the correction of each of these particular proofs. And in the context of writing out nicely why, uh, why these proofs were important in the context of checking whether that little primitive had been corrected, it becomes actually immediately apparent that the things that they're proving are not sufficient. All right, so look carefully at what they're supposed to be proving. Remember, we've got this vote expressed as a product of small primes. And we've got a sequence of different partial choice codes that are supposed to be the exponents of those values. What do we do? Well, first of all, we prove that we generated our own vote ciphertext. That's point one. That's pretty straightforward. Number two, we make another ciphertext that just involves raising our vote ciphertext to the power of our secret key. And we prove uh, that, that we did that correctly using a proof that's very, very similar to the uh, Schnorr, uh, sorry, Sean Peterson proof of equality of discrete logs that I showed a minute ago, now corrected. Point four is actually the point that's not right. So now we want to prove that all of those individual partial choice codes that we computed are each the exponentiation to k of one of the component little primes that we used as our vote. What do we do? What we should be doing is taking each individual element and proving that it is the uh, exponentiation of, of one of the components. Instead, we multiply it all together and prove that the products are the same. Well, <laughs> now that I've written it all out like that, right, any primary school student can see that the fact that the products are the same doesn't actually imply anything about whether any of the individual components are right or not. And I'm, on the one hand, I'm kind of embarrassed that it took me six months and uh, it took me and Olivier six months to notice this. But on the other hand, none of this is actually written out clearly in any of the documentation anywhere at all. Uh, and it kind of took us forever to figure out what all these uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs were supposed to be doing. So now that we've kind of thought about it in this way, it's obvious that if you're a client and you're cheating, you can cheat on all but one of these codes. You can fiddle, for example, and I think about American elections here, right? You've got to vote for president and then you've got votes for Congress people and then like 50 options later, you've got votes for dog catcher and chief of the school board. A cheating client can change your vote for president and give you the choice code that you wanted and go all the way down through Congress person and local representative and whatever. All I have to do is sacrifice the very last code and hope that you don't notice that that code's not valid because all I have to do to make the products work out is uh, make a mess of one code and choose, uh, choose everything else. Okay, so we told Swiss Post about this. It's not clear whether they cared or not. I, I hope they did. But this is not easy fixed. I mean, it's a little bit, it's fixable, but it's nowhere near uh, like the one line fix of the other two things. So this became quite a big deal in Switzerland. This, this series of discoveries was a big deal in Switzerland, uh, particularly because the... Um, the, the middle thing I mentioned about the zero-knowledge proofs not being sound actually affected systems that had already been in use. So Swiss Post decided not to offer their e-voting system in the May elections. However, they're now saying that they're intending to fix bugs and continue the development of what they refer to as their universally verifiable system. The 
there haven't really been any consequences in New South Wales. Uh, it doesn't use the Swiss code return system. It uses a completely different method of client signed verification. If you're voting in New South Wales and you want to know whether CITL's closed source web app accurately sent the vote that you asked for, you download a closed source CITL app onto your phone, <laughs> point it at the QR code that the web app displays, and it tells you what vote the web sent web thing sent in for you. What could possibly go wrong? They have now, four months after the election, finally made the code openly available. It was not openly available at election time. So in conclusion, uh, again, this is sort of Olivier's conclusion and on this slide and my conclusion on the next slide, but I, I agree completely with uh, Olivier's conclusion. Uh, this code should just not be trusted. In full stop, end of story. Uh, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. We're a small team of people. We had a brief look at it. There's a specific set of things we understand well enough to look at. Every single thing we looked for within our expertise was broken. It's overwhelmingly likely that people with a slightly different set of expertise who looked at different things would find another half dozen things. It just should have been much more carefully proven correct. It should have been much more carefully and openly reviewed. Uh, the Swiss did somewhat the right thing in making it somewhat openly available six months before the election. The thing that the New South Wales people did, in my opinion, is just unconscionable, just running this closed source, unreviewed thing for 5% of the vote in a state election. I think the Swiss regulations are actually quite good. I think the fact that good regulations were out there really helped bring to light the problems in the code. The New South Wales regulations are a disaster and the fact that it came to light at all in New South Wales was sheer good luck because a different jurisdiction had done the responsible thing instead. Uh, and just in conclusion, I want to agree with Alex from the, uh, Alex's talk in the morning, right? Actually, the huge, the biggest risk here is not the Russians or the whatever. It's people's inclination to trust what looks good without demanding to see evidence. So there you go. Questions, welcome. Questions? I mean, just broadly, I mean, do you think it's this, you know, this approach is even manageable? So you have a small company that is claiming to do this, right? So I mean, how long has Josh been thinking about this? I mean, it seems that this is an entire research program if you want to build something like this. And I don't know if there's a way that, you know, a government can realize this mm -hmm. out of this research. Yeah, because I it seems what they want to do is they say, okay, they'll fix it and we go on. But it seems that already a priority should start. You know. Yeah. For that body, but that's not the way to go. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, I think it's not the way to go either. I mean, I think it, it's very similar to the question that was asked to Alex this morning. Right? Can you think of how to do it better than this? Uh, can you think of how to do it well? Well, sure, I can think of how to do it better than this. Can I think of how to do it well enough that it should be done at all? I don't think so, no. Is there any chance of uh, automatically verifying uh, correctness of such programs? Or they are too complicated and... Uh, no automated system uh, can uh, help in verifying. I don't know. It's a really good question. Um, I have a colleague at ANU who has been working on looking at formal verification of Sigma proofs, um, Sigma protocols. But even that is just a tiny little fragment of it. And in some ways, what's actually gone wrong is the connections among the different components. So, for example, the Bayer Groth MixNet is proven secure under a certain set of assumptions, and that, that proof is correct, but then the assumptions weren't um, made true by this construction. I don't know how you would prove that automatically, how you would check that automatically. Did any manufacturer uh, of such uh, machines try to uh, have an automated proof? Or? Not as no, far as I know. I think if you look in the documentation, there, there are some 
so in the documentation of the, of the, of the Swiss system, so there is a documentation subdirectory which has some academic work in it of different sorts about random components exactly doesn't fit together, and some of the parts, some work has been done by formal verification teams, like Inria, for example. But I'm not sure to which extent. It seems it's very exactly what you're saying. So there's like some components, and then nothing. Is that formal together. verification of the protocol or of the code implementing the protocol? Yeah, exactly. The code implementing the. I seem to remember thinking of the protocol. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I think that's true. And I'll, I'll add the, the old, uh, election guard system that we're building um, is going through formal verification, but it'll only be formal verification of the specification, the kinds of things that Vanessa and LVA and others have, have caught here, just wouldn't be caught by the formal verification that's being done there. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. to Stefan's point, I think my take on this is that we need international standards and we need open software you know, so that the community as a whole get together and come up with the standards, come up. I mean, cryptographic engineering is very difficult. We still do not get it right for key exchange. I mean, those are highly sophisticated things, commitments, ability sponsors, whatever. I mean, it, you need the whole community. It's like beyond what this, any single company or even government can do. I mean, you, you need the whole community. You need the standards and a push for open source solutions that could be used by anyone. I hope you're ready to live to 100. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's going to take, probably. It's going to take a long time. Uh, so I, I worry that your conclusion is almost backwards at the end. I, I agree with everything you just said, but there really are three problems. There's a technical problem, which is a research problem. It'll take us years to get it right. There's a political problem. Sounds like the Swiss are doing the right thing, but we have to evangelize this model. The biggest problem is their third line. People's inclination is not to trust, it's to mistrust. And when I see what happens with the uh, climate change uh, problem, where there's a very large community with fairly open data looking at it and saying, we think this is happening, people still disbelieve it. I worry that when your open community says, we got it now, People still will not believe it. Someone in Kansas will say, no, there is a conspiracy. <laughs> oh, look, I read this thing, I did something wrong. And so we blog, can't close yeah. the loop socially. So, so that, that may one day be a problem, but my point is that's not the problem that we have today, right? The problem that we, we have, have today is we have <laughs> shiny, ostensibly sound internet voting systems that are trusted, but they are not trustworthy. Maybe I'll add to that. I think part of the concern is that we're trusting the wrong things. Yes, yeah. yes, right. Oh, for sure. it's there, not there, there's here. been a lot of attention over the last couple of days over the case in Mississippi where we've got videotape of somebody pushing one item on a screen and another popping up. And all the concerns and freaking out over, see, it's doing the wrong thing. And nobody's been saying, well, what if it shows me the right thing and just counts the wrong thing? <laughs> nobody's worried about that. <laughs> Right. That's a very good point, right? The thing we should be worried about is invisible findings. Yeah. Right. Which is exactly what this is about, right? Stuff that looks like it's a valid proof that it's all good, when in fact it's not a valid proof that it's all good. So how do we present it? I mean, I, I don't have expertise in this. I think I followed 60% of what you said, and I tried very hard. Uh, and I work at Microsoft. I have a background, you know, 20 some years in, in computer science. The average, uh, certainly American, but I think anywhere in the world, they have no hope of understanding the correctness or completeness of any system we put together. And for us to succeed at what I think you're trying to do here, we need to think about that problem. How when we come to something that we think is good, if we don't know how to present it, it's just not going to hang together. I wonder if you consider yeah, that aspect no, it's a, of the it's a very good point. I agree. And I mean, it, the, the, the broken stuff that isn't actually sound is indistinguishable for all normal people from the secure stuff that actually works. And in some ways, th and that's the problem, right? I don't know how to solve that problem. If I'm trying to connect your talk to my talk, I think that yes. voting systems are extremely brittle in the sense that changing one tiny element is going to move from a totally correct implementation to totally incorrect. And it's right. the same. It's really good. And that looks the same. Yeah, no, exactly. Pixels. So, I think so it's if, if you don't mind, I'm going to try to, to add something to that as well, though. Um, and that is the systems that we have now, um, we have forced trust. You must trust the authorities. You must trust the vendors. You must trust everybody. To, to get it right. We have the ability, or close to the ability, Seidel didn't quite do it, but we're trying to implement a system where, yes, maybe you won't, or most people won't you know, check all the details, but at least you're not forced to trust 
any particular entity. You're not, sure. of course, sure. trust that you can trust your favorite cryptographer, maybe, or maybe it's another. But but your 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 political party, your candidate, your your favorite news outlet, they can all independently check. You you so you can choose to delegate your trust where you want, rather than be forced to. I have to trust them. If I don't, I've got nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the sort of uh, the challenges of doing the client side verification uh, in in the model that uh, you said they were doing, where they have these partial choice codes, and uh, like I could imagine uh, like sort of positive directions in usability for someone who is faced with the the dog catcher is the only one that looks weird problem where you know a third party writes you know a, a verification app to sort of help highlight that given all the the return codes that come back um, but that's you know a small usability improvement to like a specific way of doing it uh, in general do we have ideas for how to do both voting and verification on the client side uh, Mm, that's a really good question. Good I think I think client side verification is the main thing that we don't know how to do in a usable way. I think actually the the back end stuff, the provable shuffle and decryption and stuff, actually we know how to do that. Um, I mean. They didn't get it right, but actually there's a quite well understood techniques and I think we could get that right. I think the hard bit is getting the voter to engage in a verification protocol that works. So there are lots of proposals about verification protocols, but then for just about all of them, it's not hard to think of a way of tricking an ordinary voter into not running the protocol correctly. So I, I think that's actually the really hard problem that we haven't solved yet. Else? Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you.